Hi, I'm Ryan Schumacher. Welcome back to Bible Geeks. This is the third video for week two where we're talking about hell in our series on the last things, eschatology. We're following through on uh, Tom Wright's Surprised by Hope, and I've done two videos introducing the topic and then talking about the Old Testament uh, understanding of eschatology. Now we're going to do the New Testament. Gehenna, Abyss, a Lake of Fire, let's talk about it. So from the first video, you may remember this chart. What does the Bible say about hell? And that's because hell is an English word, and hell has been used to translate lots of underlying different words, and those words have different meanings, both historically uh, and then also within the Bible, just looking at their usage. We talked about the concept of Sheol uh, in the Old Testament, how that it was the dark, damp underworld, um, truly like down below in the ground, uh, associated with the pit. But it wasn't separate, associated with the separation of the righteous and the unrighteous. Everybody went there. It wasn't associated with a lake of fiery torment. It never is. Um, so, you know, that concept differs from some of the things that we see in the New Testament. So if we want to get our concepts right, let's go through and take a look at the words that are actually used um, in the New Testament that are translated in your English Bible as hell in some cases, in, in others you'll have uh, the underlying words uh, spelled out. But let, let's look at it, and let's see if that gives us a better understanding of what's going on. So Gehenna, what the Gehenna? Uh, let's talk about that first word. This is the one that we're more familiar with. This is the one that Jesus uses uh, in the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about the uh, Gehenna of fire. So literally, uh, it's the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, uh, the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. And if you look at Joshua 15, 8, this is the valley that marked the separation of Judah and Benjamin. So it's a geographic location, a true like uh, place with geo-coordinates. You could visit it today. Um, Gehenna uh, referred to the Valley of ben Hinnom, uh, And at that time, it didn't have any kind of eschatological association with it. When that started to happen was... Uh, in the book of Jeremiah, you start to see this. Uh, the Valley of ben Hinnom is where the pagan Moloch sacrifices were made. So if somebody's not familiar, uh, Moloch was uh, one of the pagan gods, uh, and child sacrifice was a routine part of the Moloch uh, ritual. Um, if I remember right, Moloch had a like bronze hands that came out. And without getting into it too much, uh, children were put on there and they were burned to death as part of the um, Moloch ritual. Um, and so Jeremiah 32, 35, Jeremiah 7 also describes that they built high places for Baal in the valley of ben Hinnom to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Moloch. Uh, and then it goes on something that I did not will and did, never even entered my mind. Uh, so that's how the valley started getting used. Uh, and so there was a fire, and there was an association with pagan deities, the enemies of God. The things that went on in the valley of ben were things that were anathema to Yahweh. And they involved uh, enemies of God, pagan deities, and a fire and death. So later then, um, over, you know, over centuries, the Valley of ben Hinnom then became used as a garbage dump. Uh, so the refuse pile for the city of Jerusalem was in the Valley of ben, Hinnom, uh, of ben Hinnom, uh Valley of Gehenna. And there was a constant fire uh, in the garbage dump. They were incinerating their trash. We've incinerated our trash as well. Um, it's not like some industrial revolution uh, idea to start incinerating trash. And so there was a constant fire in this valley uh, where the, the trash was. Uh, so the valley that used to be where there was death and sacrifice to pagan gods through fire became a constant fire of garbage. Uh, so it, it's not hard to see, in my opinion, this is a bit of an editorial comment, but it's not hard to see why apocalyptic writers begin using the imagery of Gehenna uh, to evoke things like an unending fire and concepts like sin, um, enemies of God, people dying, 
Uh, all of that was very much caught up in historical realities of what happened in this valley that was called Gehenna at the time of Jesus. So you could have, at the time of Jesus, gone to Gehenna and seen a fire that never went out. And you as a Jew would know the history because the fire of the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, the fire of Gehenna, was one of the things that led to the exile. Um, it was the worship of the pagan gods and just the particularly insidious um, sacrifice. Just I, I don't really want to think or talk about it much. Uh, it's just terrible to think of. Uh, so the first usage of Gehenna, where it's associated with apocalyptic fire, end times fire, is uh, not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. It's in the Apocrypha. Uh, I, I should qualify this. I believe it's the first usage. If there's some uh, Apocrypha scholar who ends up watching this and um, you discover that this is an error, uh, error um, ryan.schumacher at my.wheaton.edu. Uh, please correct me, but I believe this is uh, the first one that's at least in some uh, canon that's associated with um, apocalyptic fire. So second Ezra is also known as fourth Ezra. Uh, according to the Ethiopian church, this was written by Ezra during the Babylonian captivity, uh, during the exile. So between sometime between 600 and 500. I think the uh, temple was destroyed in 572 and rebuilt in uh, 518, I think. Uh, the exile began, uh, began sometime around 600, and they returned in like 539, I think. Um, so it, it's like somewhere during this period, uh, this is an apocalypse of Ezra. This is uh, visions of the future. Now, contemporary scholarship doesn't date it that far back, does not attribute authorship to Ezra. Uh, I have no opinion. I have not studied the authorship of 2nd Ezra as much at all. Uh, I think placing it at 70 AD is pretty incredible, um, like incredibly late, just as a gut reaction, but I don't know. Um, but sometime in the period uh, around the exile to the time of Jesus. Uh, and what's contained in there are seven visions of Ezra. We're going to talk a bit more about the visions and what to make of visions generally in the Bible in the next video. But he is asking why Israel is suffering. So whether or not it was written during the Babylonian captivity, the setting of the book is the Babylonian captivity. And Ezra is praying and asking why is Israel going through the suffering that they're going through in the exile. And he has seven visions where, you know, he's told humans can't understand why, but the end is near. And he describes what he sees in those visions. So in one of them, and I have this for the class later, but let's pull out the full reference here. Uh, so um, second Ezra, fourth Ezra, um, chapter seven, starting at 36. Uh, so the pit of torment shall appear and opposite of it shall be the place of rest and the furnace of hell um, shall be disclosed and opposite of it the paradise of delight. Then the Most High will say to the nations have been raised from the dead. Look now and understand whom you have denied, who have you not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and that. Here are delight and rest and here are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment, a day that has no sun or moon or stars or cloud or thunder or lightning, wind or water or air, darkness, evening or morning, summer, spring, heat, winter, frost, cold, hail, rain, dew, noon, night, dawn, shining, brightness, light, but only the splendor of the Most High, which will be seen by all. Uh, which all shall see what has been destined. Okay, so you have in here, uh, in particular, that furnace of hell, uh, that's Gehenna. So this is where we see that as a uh, eschatological furnace of vision uh, shows up there. Let me see if, just for fun, if, it, if there's actually the word Gehenna uh, untranslated in the NRSV. It doesn't look like it. Oh, but I'm looking at Matthew. Let's look at second Ezra's. Yeah, let's see if it's untranslated. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. it's just translated as hell. Okay, so uh, there you go. The furnace of hell, Gehenna, shall be disclosed in the opposite of it, the paradise of delight. Interesting there too, that if for one of the first times, if not the first time, uh, you have hell 
in Paradise as uh, uh, being opposite of each other. And also later on in that passage, too, they can look at each other. We'll just throw a bookmark there. So what's the biblical use of Gehenna? So again, we talked up here about the historical um, use behind it, uh, some of the Old Testament descriptions of the Valley of Gehenna. We talked about the apocryphal. What's the use in particular, I guess, in the New Testament? That would be the better way to put this. So it's uh, 12 times. Um, and you'll see it's always translated. Gehenna is always translated as hell. That's this up here. And the 12 of 12, here are your verses. Here are the 12 places where the word hell is used, um, or at least the word Gehenna is used, I should say. Uh, so you see a little bit of clustering. First here is Matthew chapter 5, uh, Sermon on the Mount. Um, you see a couple later in Matthew. You see uh, a cluster in Mark here. This is parallel uh, to Matthew's Sermon on the Mount here. Uh, and then to one in Luke and one in James. So if you say, you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. That's the Gehenna uh, Tempiros. Then uh, we're familiar with this. It's better to lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. Uh, that would be like your eye or your hand. Pluck your eye out, cut your hand off. Um, here's the uh, you know parallelism here uh, with Matthew chapter 10 and then Luke 12. So uh, fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. In Luke 12, um, fear him who has the authority to cast into hell. Uh, you have Mark's parallelism here. It's better to enter life maimed than have two hands and go into hell, to have two feet than be thrown into hell, have two eyes and be thrown into hell. So really, you have the Sermon on the Mount. It's duplicated in, uh, or parallel mentions in Matthew and Mark. You have uh, the mention here, fear, do not fear those who can uh, merely kill the body. Uh, and then a couple other scattered references. But it's really... Uh, it's really brought around those couple places. That's where you see this in the Bible. Um, this is also where you see an association with fire. So Gehenna, the Gehenna of fire, uh, shows up in both Matthew and Mark. And uh, Mark adds unquenchable fire uh, to that as well. So your notion of fiery judgment in the New Testament now shows up in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Sermon on the Mount. That's where you see it. One thing that I thought was notable, and we'll get to this in the next video, Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, is absent from this list. That is because the word Gehenna is not used to describe uh, where the rich man ends up. That is Hades, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. All right. So is Gehenna the lake of fire? So uh, lake of fire is uh, what you see often in Revelation. In fact, if we were to do a quick search uh, for Lake of Fire. Where do we see it? Uh, we see that, and let's just, we'll pick our tight translation here. You have Revelation uh, chapter 20, 14, 10, and then 1920. Lake of Fire is a term that shows up infrequently, and it's used in Revelation only. Notice that it is not uh, indicative, uh, like it's Gehenna is not the word in here. Uh, so are they the same? Uh, we have this description here, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, uh, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Sounds pretty similar. Now the Greek here, uh, let's see, limne, limnen, Tom uh, Peros, uh, so literally Lake of Fire, um, is the underlying word here. It is not Gehenna. Therefore, it's not certain that they're the same, but it sure sounds the same. Like, to be totally honest, Unquenchable Fire, Lake of Fire, is this really that different? Uh, I'm going to say no. Um, but John in Revelation does not use the word Gehenna, and Jesus does not say the Lake of Fire. So it leaves open the possibility that there's a nuance difference. Uh, I looked at the Anchor Bible Dictionary, the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible, uh, the Lexham Bible Dictionary. All of them were treating this the same way, which was because there's not an explicit uh, biblical link uh, where 
like lake of fire is referred to as Gehenna, or Gehenna is used to translate it uh, or described as the lake of fire. Um, we're going to reserve judgment, but each one of them at the end said either possibly or probably the same as the lake of fire. Uh, so I believe it is safe for our purposes to conflate the two. Uh, and that, that has interesting ramifications for the way that one might interpret Revelation, but we'll get to that later. Um, cause if you believe the lake of fire in Revelation is referring specifically to Gehenna, and therefore a historical place, uh, I suppose you could think of it as, as an eschatological thing, but you also now have the opportunity to make it a historical place if you make that connection. Uh, but the Bible does not make that explicit connection. That is a theological judgment. Now, what's interesting is that there's at least another hell. Um, in many of your Bibles, you will see in 2 Peter 2.4, um, Peter referred to something and say, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, committed them to the chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment, end phrase, because that's all that really matters for what we're uh, talking about now. So were the angels cast into the valley that separated Judah and Benjamin? Uh, that would be interesting and weird. Now, if Gehenna were translated, uh, were the underlying word here, then that might give us a bit more of an idea that, okay, Gehenna is being used to describe, it's an idiom to describe some sort of future uh, fiery pit. But that's not the underlying word here. Uh, the underlying word, uh, Tartaro, uh, not Gehenna. And unfortunately, we are robbed of one of our best tools for understanding words in the Bible, which is to see where else they're used. Uh, this is the only usage of the word in the Bible. Hapax legamenon would be the uh, term that would apply to it. So we have to go outside of the Bible to understand what this term means. Uh, we can make a link, hell and Tartarus, um, because that's how it's translated, but what does it mean? Does it mean the same thing as Gehenna? Um, and the answer is no, it means something different. So Tartarus uh, was the prison of the Titans in Greek mythology. If you remember the story of Prometheus, um, who is, uh, or is it Epimetheus? I think it was Epimetheus that was uh, chained and his liver was eaten out by the vultures every day and then it regrew just to be eaten out again. Uh, that prison was in Tartarus. Uh, the Titans themselves, uh, which were the, like during the cosmog cosmogonic event, uh, the earliest stories of the creation of things in Greek mythology involves the Titans. Um, the Titans were ultimately bound and chained in Tartarus, the prison in Greek mythology. Uh, it is also described in a Jewish uh, apocalypse called First Enoch. Um, First Enoch is a book that I had only tangentially heard of before and did not expect to have spent hours in in preparation for uh, Bible Geeks this week. But First Enoch describes, uh, you remember the passage on Enoch walked with God and was no more. He was like caught up uh, from Genesis. The Apocalypse of Enoch, First Enoch, is a book written that essentially describes uh, what Enoch saw when he was taken away, and visions of the future uh, that are attributed to Enoch when Enoch walked with God, and he's sort of taken around, he's taken on a tour of uh, the netherworld uh, by archangels. Um, so if you want to know where like Archangel Raphael comes from, uh, he's mentioned in First Enoch. Uh, and in there, it describes the fate of the angels who fathered the Nephilim. This is uh, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, a very peculiar passage. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and uh, then the Nephilim were there in the age, and you have the giants, and uh, all of this that sounds very bizarre to our modern ears. Uh, this is uh, a topic in First Enoch, uh, as well as in uh, Peter. First Peter 3, we'll talk about it. So... This, uh, this word is used to describe um, the, uh, the spirit prison. So there's a couple places. Uh, secondly, the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot and throw him into the darkness. And this blazing fire which thou beholdest running towards the west is that of all the luminaries of heaven. Uh, 
I, I didn't do big block quotes from here, but the idea of this prison of the angels is seen in uh, First Enoch, prison of the gods uh, called Tartarus, seen in Greek mythology. This is the idea that uh, Peter's appealing to, and in particular, the imprisonment of the watchers uh, is what's coming out here. The watchers being the, uh, the angels from Genesis chapter 6. So if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. So that's what we're seeing there. Now is uh, a couple of questions come up here. Is Tartarus the same as the abyss in the bottomless pit? Um, because we hear that as a place where the demons are bound. Um, so, you know, Luke chapter 8, they, the demons, beg Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. Uh, and then Revelation chapter 20, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the abyss, holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So that seems like it's a prison. Um, and it sure sounds like it's the same thing. It's never specifically referred to with that word. Um, the abyss, though, it is uh, what's interesting is it's associated with the deep in the Septuagint, maybe even the deepest parts of Sheol. But the abyss, uh, abyssos, is translated as deep in the Old Testament. And this is where the chaos monsters were. This is where Leviathan and Rahab were the... Uh, in fact, you know what? Let's just pull this up. Uh, le let's do this. This old, I think I can find it. Uh, Zondervan Bible background commentary. It's right here at the beginning. Uh, where it shows the map of the, yeah, here we go. The map of the three-tiered universe. Uh, so let's look at this, look at this image here. You can see, uh, I can't blow it up easily right now, but you can see it right here where you have the vaulted dome. That's from Genesis uh, chapter 1. You have the heavens above with God's domain. You have the disk of the earth. You have the waters below with the underworld. And then you've got this dragon down here. Uh, that's because their idea was that the there were monsters of chaos, essentially, uh, that lived in the uh, in the waters. So the sky is supported by mountains at the edges, holding back the waters above. Numerous graves led to the netherworld, Sheol, and the cosmic waters surrounded the earth and the horizontal plane. Uh, lurking in the depths is mighty Leviathan. Uh, so like that's the abyss, the deep, is where like the demons were. There's this idea that, or these monsters, that whatever is down there is where bad things are kept. Uh, so in the uh, Apocalypse of John, that's where the devil or Satan, uh, the revelation of John, Apocalypse, which is the underlying Greek word, uh, is bound. Uh, demons say that's their home. Uh, there's spirits in prison. I think that all of these things are probably the same, uh, but they're never specifically equated in, um, in the text of the scripture. Okay, so I think we've pretty much covered everything. Let's just pull up our data model here and see if we missed anything. Um, you know, I didn't spend a ton of time on this, uh, on these other connections. But um, you have Abaddon, which was another name for Sheol, Sheol personified, uh, is described as the angel of the abyss in Revelation chapter 9. Um, we have this link from Tartarus, um, the going to the abyss that we just talked about as well as the deep where you know you have the abode of monsters like Rahab, Tiamat, the goddess of chaos um, in Revelation the abyss is described as the realm of locusts, it's ruled by Abaddon it's a place where uh, Satan is confined for a thousand years when afterwards he's thrown in the lake of fire just like Hades and death is thrown in the lake of fire Gehenna probably is the same thing as the lake of fire um, and then we didn't talk too much about paradise and uh, new creation or heaven either, but uh, paradise and heaven are only equated in one place, um, which was Paul. Uh, he's synonymizing it with heaven in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 2. So, 
yeah, I know a person in, in Christ, he's referring to himself, who is caught up in the third heaven. Um, whether or not the body, I don't know. I know that such a person was caught up into paradise. Um, when Jesus talks about paradise with the thief on the cross, uh, he describes that as where he's going um, and that he thinks that the, um, or he says the thief will be with him. Uh, but he didn't say heaven. The only place where heaven and paradise are equated is Paul right there in 2 Corinthians 12. Um, and then ultimately in Revelation, heaven is joined with earth and is remade into the new creation. So something that comes across here is that uh, paradise and uh, Hades ultimately uh, end up becoming new creation and like a fire. So there's like this transitory stage where there's the abode of the dead right now. Uh, there's paradise and death and Hades end up like exist. Uh, and then they end up getting tossed into the lake of fire. And then there's uh, paradise, which is joined with earth and reformed into the new creation. So that's your really quick overview of New Testament eschatology. Uh, I suppose I'm feeling kind of badly that I didn't dig in a little bit more in uh, the spirit prison in First Peter. Uh, I think I'll get into that in the next video, though. Why don't I do that? So uh, that'll bring us to the end here. We'll talk about that a bit in the next uh, video, but thanks for watching this video about New Testament eschatology. And uh, I'm going to say please subscribe because, frankly, I do want you to subscribe. And join me for the next video that's going to be really important. That's the one that is going to talk about how we read apocalyptic literature. What should we do with all of this? So please join for that. Uh, God bless. Thanks.